Let's do this. Let's talk about theory of computation and the Chomsky hierarchy. So we've been talking about finite state machines. Finite state machines are a kind of abstraction of what a computer program does. If you think about them, uh, going from state to state with a transition is sort of similar to saying, if something happens, then do something else. If I get this input, then perform this output. This uh, finite state machine is an abstraction of what a computer program can do. And it is only one type of abstraction. There's many other ways to explain what computer uh, programs can perform on strings, the kinds of operations they can perform. And we call these formal grammars. The Chomsky hierarchy is the description of these grammars from most restrictive, which is what we've been seeing so far, finite state machines, to most powerful, which is Turing machines, which essentially can generalize to performing any operation on a string. Some of these formal grammars are going to help us overcome the difficulties that we've had. For example, the fact that some things in language have long distance dependencies, where two distant states have to communicate with one another in order to work. They can help us overcome the problems of recursion, where our finite state machine has to keep going down and down and down and then remember the path upwards and upwards and upwards so that it goes down n times and then it comes back up an equal n number of times. Likewise, they could help us with the problem of context, where before you apply a rule, you need to figure out uh, what other symbols there are around you, and depending on those, you perform the rule in one way or the other. So again, finite state of, uh, machines are just one type of automaton, and there's other systems that are less restrictive, and they are here in the Chomsky hierarchy. Type 3 is a regular grammar, which is the kind of grammar that a finite state machine can describe, and we have other types of grammars, context-free, context-sensitive, and unrestricted, or computationally enumerable. Let's look at each one of them. A type 3 grammar, or regular grammar, is what we have been seeing so far. A finite state machine is a subtype of regular grammar. You can have a rule that has one input where you have one task that you want to perform, create a sentence, you don't need to look at the sentence before or after to perform the task, you only want to create this sentence here. And you create the sentence by making the symbol a n times, or having many symbols n times, m times. But there's no way for you to coordinate that these two run at the same time. Each state is independent of each other in how many times it executes. This is our grammar of the basic structures that we had so far, like Jane eats pizza, one noun for the subject, one verb, and zero or more nouns for the direct object. English sentences, in English sentences, the number of nouns for the subject and the number of nouns for the direct objects are not connected. If you have Jane Smith here, you do not need to have two words in the direct object. You, Jane Smith eats pizza, where this is two and this is one, is a perfectly valid English sentence. So this is a type of rule that will be described through a regular grammar. Let's look at a context-free grammar. This is one where you have a single variable going in, you know, you want, you want to generate a sentence, and then the output or the right side of the rule can be anything. You can have more than one symbol. These symbols can coordinate how many times you run them, but then you would need to program something to help them remember. It can be a variable somewhere that remembers that n is equal to 3. It can be a data structure like a pushdown stack, where if you push a n times, then you know you have to pop a n times. And so the popping could be the, the number of times you run b. 
So if you pop A, one, two, three, and then, I'm sorry, if you push them, one, two, three, and then you know you have to pop them, one, two, three. This could be the number of times you have B. B, B, B. So as you can see, you could implement memory with a structure, like a push down stack. You could implement it with a variable. There, there's something that you'll have to do that is additional to the description of the states and their transitions. This is, of course, going to cost you computationally. One rule that uh, is a con uh, can be explained with a context-free grammar is center embedding. For example, the uh, sentences like, the cat that I like eats tuna, where you have a sentence um, like, the cat eats tuna, and then the noun phrase can also have a sub-sentence, the cat that I like eats tuna, for example. In the final configuration, you need cat, cat, uh, I, and then like, eats. So you need to uh, push two nouns and then pop two verbs. Or you can just have a variable that remembers that n is equal to two and tracks that you have two nouns going in and need two verbs going out. This is a context-free grammar. And again, it's context-free because in order for you to construct your sentence, you do not need to look at previous sentences or at following sentences. A type 1 grammar is a context-sensitive grammar. In these kinds of rules, you can have anything on the left side and anything on the right side. But you do need to have, for every input, and output. For every time, for every uh, element like A to the N, you need to output something. It might be the same or it might be different. For example, in the Yoruba emphatics, we have a rule that took a vowel, a tone, and a consonant if it existed. For every vowel you had in the input, you had to give, you have to produce the vowel in the output. For every consonant you had in the input, you had to bring the consonant to the output. But then for every tone in the input, you had to read it, you had to perform an operation on it, and you had to give us an output. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence even if the output itself is different. We call it again context sensitive because in order for you to know what DEF is, you need to read some things about ABC. And in order for you to know what um, A, B, and C, how A, B, and C are going to interact, you need to actually look at them, to look at the sounds before and after you. So regular grammars are, for example, a basic English sentence. Context-free grammars are center embedding, which is more complex and you need to coordinate things, but you still don't need to look at sentences around you. A context-sensitive grammar this one where you do need to look at the sounds around you, like in Yoruba tones. And an unrestricted grammar, or a computationally enumerable grammar, is anything else. One where you can have an arbitrary number of symbols as the input, and then produce some output that is not necessarily matched to the input. Human languages probably don't have these kinds of rules, but this is the kind of rule that can be uh, handled by a Turing machine. A Turing machine would take a string, an input string of any kind, and an, an arbitrary number of symbols, and then it would transform it into some other string with an arbitrary number of symbols in the output. Of course, the problem with this is that this comes with added computational power. We can take any input and put it into any out and convert it into any output. But now the cost is that not only is our processing going to skyrocket, we cannot even guarantee that we're ever going to stop the operation. More on this in the next video. In summary, we have four main types of grammars for the Chomsky hierarchy. We have regular grammars, which take one input and have many outputs, but these outputs are each of them independent from the other. Uh, and, yeah, they don't remember how the other behaved. This is our syntax of sentences in English. We have context-free grammars, 
where we have one input, doesn't need to look at the context, and we can have many outputs, and these outputs can communicate with one another. And we would need to implement some computational way for them to communicate, a push down stack, for example. So we know that we push so many in, and we need to pop so many out. A context-sensitive grammar would be one that takes an arbitrary, I'm sorry, that takes input, and then for every input, you need to write an output. You can transform symbols, and with this, uh, make the rule context-sensitive, because you need to look at them in order to know what you're doing, but you need to provide, for every input, an output. Finally, an unrestricted grammar is one where the rules can take any form. You can take any string and transform it into any other string. Human languages probably don't have these, but uh, this is the kind of, of rule that we actually do need in computer science, for example. So we can finally make the definition very precise. Finite state machines are a kind of automaton. A finite state machine is one that uh, generates regular languages in the form, for example, AN, BM, P. You can generate an arbitrary number of symbols an arbitrary number of times, but they're not going to be communicating with one another. We can only have uh, transitions between states, so you cannot have communications across distant states in finite state machines. Um, you can have them in other types of grammars, but this is going to cost us computationally. This, by the way, is the same hierarchy, just displayed slightly differently. As you can see, we have, as in finite languages, as the most restrictive kinds of languages. Within it, for example, we have uh, logic, like true or false statements. We have rules that are regular, that can be modeled by finite state machines. For example, our English consonant clusters have some structure to construct syllables, but we only need to look inside of our syllable to construct it. We don't need to look at other syllables to know what our syllable needs to look like. We have context-free rules where you need to implement means for the computer to remember what it's doing, such as a stack, for example, or variables, or in some other way, so that you can have as many and nouns and as many verbs as you need. But you still don't need to look at the sentences around you. We have at the um, outside edges of this hierarchy a rule like the Yoruba emphatic, where you have a rule that takes a part of a syllable, reads it, and then generates the output based on what it saw in its immediate con in its context. Not just immediate context, but it can be context several symbols away, several sounds away. Like in the second case, sun un, where you have to go not one, but two back, and could potentially go even further back. And again, we don't know if human languages have rules that are more complicated than this. We would call those computationally innumerable rules. In summary, human languages do have rules that are context sensitive and that cannot be modeled by finite state machines. Some rules in language are fairly easy to model and some rules are more complex to model. There's many types of formal grammars that we can use to generate computer programs. And the Chomsky hierarchy tells us what, how much power are we gonna need in our computer program to handle a rule of human language. Uh, next week, we're, sorry, next week, next video, we're gonna look at the consequences of having to use different grammars. And spoiler alert, the, the more complex the formal grammar, the more we're gonna have to, more resources we're gonna have to invent, invest for it to be processed, the more costly it's going to be, and ultimately the problem is going to explode out of control.